Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Design to Deliver Application Support webinar. I see there are quite a few um, participants that are still entering in the Zoom call, so um, I'll start with the introductions um, and we'll allow you in as, as you come. Um, so first things first, um, my name is Giulia Lorenzini and I'm the Innovation Funding Team Lead at Connected Places Catapult. So a very, very warm welcome to you all for joining us today. Um, as I said, this is the application support webinar for our brand new Design to the Liver program. We are very, very um, excited to be working together with two other catapults, the Satellite Applications Catapult and the Digital Catapult. Uh, more on that uh, soon. Um, for a really exciting program, which um, we'll tell you all about today and that launched officially last week. So a couple of housekeepings before we get started. As you can see, there's a Q&A function um, at the bottom of your screen. So please feel free to add your questions uh, throughout the course of the webinar. We have a Q&A section at the end and we will do our best to answer as we go, but we will um, we will do a proper Q&A session at the end as well. Any questions that will not be answered live today, we'll take it away and ensure that uh, are answered um, promptly by Monday next week. Uh, also, I just wanted to confirm that this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available as well um, as of Monday next week. Um, whilst we wait for a few more to join, if we can move through to the agenda. So, as you probably saw when you signed up, um, we will take you through a brief introduction to the Catapult Network. As I said, this is a cross-Catapult um, program. So, um, Pete, my colleague Pete, will give you an introduction to the network and also the Design to Deliver program. Um, Ellie will then take us through the overall brief um, of the program and then together with Francesca and Julia, from um, Digital Catapult and Satellite um, Application Catapult, respectively, uh, that will explain in a bit more details um, what the challenges um, are and um, a bit more of an of a, a insight into what's uh, on offer. We will then hand over to Anya from the Innovation Funding Team, who will give you some tips and um, uh, some further explanation on applications and um, how uh, you, can, you can join. And also, if you've got any questions, how to reach us. And as I said, we'll have a Q&A session at the end. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Pete. Just trying to turn my camera off. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Pete Broadbent, and I'm uh, one of the design leads here at the Connected Places Catapult. Uh, I've been involved with Design to Deliver since the very beginning, so I wanted to just give you a bit of an overview of, of what we're doing and uh, and why we're doing it. Um, if we could get the next slide, please, Kat. So, oh. So where this has come from um, is many of you may have worked with the Catapult Network uh, over the years. You may even uh, have done projects with us uh, and quite likely you may have had funding from Innovate UK in the past. So um, the Catapult Network has been around since uh, around 2011. It's grown over the years. Um, key things here is the amount of SMEs that we've supported. So nearly eight and a half thousand SMEs have been supported by the Catapults and the Catapult Network. Um, a lot of grants flow, flow through us and we do a lot of support for, uh, for the SME community. Um, what makes this programme quite unique? Can we get the next slide, please, Kat? As Julia mentioned, uh, we have three Catapults involved here. Um, and the important thing to consider is this isn't three separate, you know, we're not going off and doing three separate competitions. We've been working on this together. So the brief that you're going to hear later has been put together so that there is a, a connection between all of these catapults. So myself at Connected Places Catapult, Satellite Applications and Digital Cat have been working uh, very closely to pull this together. Um, the programme has been developed in collaboration and is funded by Innovate UK. Um, they've been very close to this as well. They've been very much part of the process of, of, uh, of, of designing this. Um, 
And this is quite unique that we've been working as a you know, across all of these catapults. The reason it's us three and not the others, uh, we're not excluding them at all. The, the reason being is all three of us have got very, very mature design teams. So we've been working on this because as you're here today, uh, design and, and, the, and the design industry is quite key to what, what, what we're doing. Um, if you could pop to the next slide, please, Kat. So the aim of Design to Deliver is to harness the potential of the UK design sector. Um, what do we mean by this? So we feel that the small and medium sized enterprises uh, do not necessarily benefit from the extent of the design industry in the UK. So what we're doing here is we have got funding so that you and your SMEs can work with really high end, really high caliber design consultancies to help you to develop your your, your solutions, uh, your products, your services to tackle some of the UK's biggest challenges. So if you think of this as a uh, grant funding, not just so that you can go off and, uh, and do some work, we are giving you grant funding, but we're also giving you access to a, a really high end design consultancy to work with you to make your solutions um, uh, better and stronger and to grow. So it's it's really important that we, we you know that this is part of the part of the program. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please, Kat. So the opportunities, we're going to go into this in a bit more detail. My colleague Anya will talk you uh, through the details of exactly what we're doing. Uh, I don't want to steal anyone's thunder, but the, the, the key things here is that the funding for the solution, we are giving funding to 12 SMEs. So that's 12 SMEs across the three catapults. We're giving you access to specialist design support from selected design consultancies. Um, we are going to give you technical support from the catapult experts. So if you've done projects with us in the past, you, you will know the kind of support that we give. Uh, we will also be giving uh, that kind of support for, the, for this programme. Um, the final point here, and this is another uniqueness with, with Design to Deliver, is giving you access to real world environments via our three location partners. So our location partners are here today and they're gonna talk you through a bit more about, about their locations uh, and, why, and, and why they've been chosen. So in essence, in a nutshell really, we are giving you funding uh, to work with design consultancies in locations to really move your product services uh, innovations forward. So we're quite excited about uh, about how this is uh, how this is going to shape up and what and the and what this will open up for you. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. So as I mentioned earlier, we are taking a place based approach. So we are very much interested in looking at uh, how your products and services can help a region, a community, a street. Uh, potentially a park, uh, potentially even down to a household. So um, we even have coastlines. So, but I won't, uh, I won't touch on that just yet. So we're taking a systems and place-based approach, and it's very important that the three challenges are interlinked. And we'll talk you through what we mean by that uh, in a bit. So um, I'm really excited to have you all here today and to hear a bit more about design to deliver. Um, I think it's probably a good time to talk you through what the what the challenges are. So um, get next slide, please. So I'm going to hand over to uh, to Ellie Pyle, uh, who works in uh, with me at the Connected Places Catapult, uh, to talk you through what the brief is. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Pete. Um, yeah, so my name is Ellie Pyle. I am a senior service designer at the Connected Places Catapult, and I've been working on Design to Deliver over the past couple of months. Uh, so I'm going to talk you through the overarching brief, uh, and then we will go into the individual challenges for each of the catapult. So if we go to the next slide. So as Pete mentioned, um, all three catapults came together and we wanted to look at one brief that could unite us and that we could all be working uh, towards as a collective. And for this year for Design to Deliver, that is unlocking human behaviours to regenerate nature through, le <clears throat> through leveraging accessible, accurate and actionable information. Um, and if you go to the next slide. So that really breaks down into three sections. So um, we believe that information flows is really important um, for regenerating nature. Recently, there has been an explosion of information and data. There's so much more, um, there's so many more technologies producing data and, and 
um, so much more available. And that is also linked to an increase in climate anxiety, and it can lead to a feeling of powerlessness and uncertainty in what steps to take next. So we really need to be making sure that that information is accessible, accurate and actionable in order to be able to make those, those um, changes in behaviour change. Um, for us, a key focus was um, realising the value of nature. Globally, around a quarter of plants and animals are a risk of an e extinction within an, the next decade. So we do really believe that this is a critical challenge and particularly for the UK. So the UK is one of the most nature deprived uh, nations in the world. And therefore this does sit as a, a challenge that we should all be focusing on. And the, the various factors represent uh, can be critical for um, unlocking this challenge and, and really making change. And then the third part of this is taking action. So we don't want to just be um, creating information and, and creating more data, but we really want to be taking that next step to create um, positive behavior change and really making sure that we are using that information to ensure that there is um, action taken on realizing the value of nature. And if we go to the next slide, please. So, um, as we said, there are three catapults involved and that breaks down into three challenges that represent the expertise of each of the catapults uh, and the sectors that they work within. So for challenge one, we have collective solutions for wild urban places, and that is the connected places catapult challenge. And then for challenge two, we have informed choices for nature positive actions, and that is the digital catapult. And the third challenge is space enabled information for a thriving world. And that is the satellite applications challenge. So I'm gonna briefly talk you through uh, challenge one uh, for the connected places catapult. So if you go to the next slide. So uh, the challenge one is led by connected place catapult and uh, our location partner is Shift and the um, Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park. And Francesca will give you an introduction uh, to the Olympic Park at the end of this. Uh, so if you go to the next slide. So the Connected Places Catapult is the UK's innovator for um, innovation accelerator for transport, place leadership and cities. Um, so we work across various sectors. So if you go to the next slide. Uh, this shows the seven sectors that we work within. So maritime, aviation, rail, infrastructure, place leadership, homes and housing, and ecosystem innovation. Uh, and we connect markets, smart, spark innovation technology, and accelerate to commercialization, really focused on transport systems and uh, cities. Uh, and so our challenge, if you go to the next slide, uh, is collective solutions for wild urban places. And we are asking SMEs how can you use information to contribute to the successful uh, implementation, stewardship and maintenance of wild urban places? And we think that this is a really key challenge. Um, urbanisation is increasing across the globe and therefore um, our relationship with nature is very critical within uh, urban environments. So how are we looking after uh, implementing and maintaining the, um, the wild places that we have with uh, in urban environments. And we think there's a lot, lots of possibilities within this. So if you go to the next slide. Oh. Uh, so we think there's possibility for connecting information about nature. Um, the implementation and maintenance of inclusive green spaces within urban environments is often hindered by fragmented efforts. There's multiple stakeholders that need to be involved in um, looking after and maintaining uh, natural spaces within urban environments. And there can be a disconnect between valuing, paying for and quantifying the benefits of these spaces. And that can sometimes lead to them being framed as a burden rather than opportunity. So by connecting information and ensuring that the right information is with the right people at the right time, um, we can help link up the benefits of nature uh, and the way that we value it. If we go to the next slide. So we think it's also important to understand the impact um, of impact 
on human and non-human inhabitants. So understanding the impact of green urban spaces on both human and non-human inhabitants can um, really be beneficial in making the case for protecting and um, investing in wild urban places. There's lots of benefits that are wide reaching and uh, linked to various co-benefits like mental health. So by collecting information and disseminating and communicating the benefits in the right way, we can give a voice to nature and really lead to positive um, behavior change. And then the next slide. Uh, the, the, la the last one that I'm going to talk about is wild urban corridors. So cities um, and urban centers are often characterized by fragmented green spaces and well-kept parklands. Um, but we can use technology to map these spaces, monitor them, and effectively make the case for creating new pockets of wild urban places uh, and connecting them together. There's lots of information that can be translated so that the various stakeholders involved, such as urban planners, ecologists and local communities, can effectively make decisions to look after these places. Uh, and the next slide. So we're really excited about um, the opportunity to think about how we can have collective solutions for wild urban places. Um, we think there are various solutions that could um, be relevant for this uh, challenge. There's lots of technologies looking at collaborative platforms for facilitating decision making, um, using data to map and monitor um, green urban environments, uh, and also to help visualize um, and connect people with the benefits uh, and the impact that nature can have in urban environments. So we think there is a, a, a vast array of um, technologies that might be able to help with um, this challenge. Uh, and I, if we go to the next slide, I will hand over to Francesca uh, from the Queen Elizabeth Park to talk about the location that we have for this challenge. Thank you, Ellie. It's a pleasure to be here and with you all. So my name is Francesca Coloca. I'm head of innovation for SHIFT at the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park. Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park is fast becoming a leading national innovation testbed. It's owned by the Mayor of London and managed by the London Legacy Development Corporation. The innovation program is facilitated by SHIFT, which we are calling East London's Innovation Catalyst. Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park was built to both enable the 2012 London Olympics and to provide a foundation for long-term sustainable urban regeneration in East London. So today the park receives over 12 million visitors a year. It's home to 600 businesses and it's situated in the, one of the most diverse parts of the UK with 104 languages spoken in Newham alone. By 2036, the park is projected to have 33,000 homes within its 560 acre estate. So it's fast becoming a new metropolitan center for London. The estate has been sustainably designed with eco-friendly infrastructure, award-winning biodiverse gardens, open spaces, wetlands, seven kilometers of waterways and rivers, roads, pavements, and lampposts alongside world-class sporting venues, homes, shopping areas, and business districts, all in zone two of uh, UK's leading global, global city, of course. So the diversity of the state, um, which is largely under singular public management, um, means that there's huge potential to use the estate as a platform for testing and showcasing novel approaches to promoting biodiversity in urban places. So this includes utilizing the digital assets of the testbed like uh, utilities and energy data, footfall and air quality data, for example. So SHIFT uh, has a track record of facilitating innovation trials within uh, with SMEs and corporate partners. Um, we've delivered 45 innovation trials to date on the Olympic Park and in the surrounding neighborhoods. And there's an established process for scouting sites for innovation trials, scoping the requirements for health and safety legal planning, as well as a team of nine people to support you to deliver innovation trials. Site specificity, requirements, and proper timelines are, of course, key to delivering successful innovation trials, and we can help with all of that. So trialing on the Olympic Park means you'll not only capitalize on the rich landscape I've described, but also be able to tap into SHIFT's robust stakeholder network, which includes over 200 other innovation organizations across public, private, university, and local nonprofit sectors. Um, SHIFT also has the capacity to tap into a range of people networks. If uh, SMEs want to develop focus groups or specific user testing groups, for example, our Elevate Youth Network uh, of over 200 local young people, local residents groups, and a pool of citizen scientists. Um, so lots on offer. 
we're particularly excited about the interplay between um, biodiversity and environment uh, on the park and the surrounding urban fabric. Um, so everything from the plant life, animal species, um, the public realm, the environmental factors and technology and the interplay with technology and that citizen engagement angle with technology. Resilient systems are key to, uh, to us as an urban uh, wild park. Um, uh, for example, really excited about the idea of cleaning the River Lee and creating better access for East Londoners, uh, 1.2 million people surrounding that river. Um, so we're really excited to be part of this program and look forward to working with some of you. Thank you. And I believe I hand over to the next challenge lead. Thanks, Francesca. <clears throat> Um, hi everyone, um, I am the design lead for Digital Catapult. Um, my name is also Francesca um, and I'm the senior product designer here at Digital Catapult. Um, and I will be explaining our challenge and then introducing you to Melissa uh, from Bristol, our location partner. Uh, next slide, please. So to give you a little bit of information about Digital Catapult, um, we focus on accelerating the practical application of deep tech uh, we work both with government on government challenges and with commercial clients, uh, and we're really looking to see how we can solve some of the UK's economy uh, and societal issues using technology. Um, we're trying to break down barriers, de-risk innovation, open up markets, and responsibly shape products and services to provide us with a better future here in the UK. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. So what does that mean? It means that we work uh, on accelerator programs and innovation programs. Uh, we have our own testbed facilities, we run pilots and proof of concepts, as well as testing business models uh, with SMEs uh, and other partners. And we also work on a lot of research and development projects, uh, which help to inform policy changes and recommendations. Um, we also have within house um, several deep techs. We have an immersive lab, we have an IoT lab, AI, um, network specialists and quantum team. And the types of people that we work with, so it's a lot on government and public sector projects. Then we work with startups and scale-ups, um, industry leaders, whether that be in energy or telecoms. Uh, we work with investors, research and academia, and as, this, as with this program, uh, Catapult Network. Uh, next slide, please. So for our challenge, what we really wanted to focus on was how do we use this data that is sort of prolific at the moment and actually make sense of it. Um, I found that most of the um, data on climate change out there is, is one, it's very scary, um, but it's very dense data-led uh, reports. And they're often sort of calling for either governments or businesses or even communities to make change. But rarely is it sort of addressed to us as individual citizens um, to, to do our part to help. So we really want to see with this challenge how we can enable citizens uh, to feel empowered by trustworthy information um, to make that change and to actually create positive behavior change in their actions, which will have better impact on nature. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, so our challenge is um, how do we help people have informed choices for nature positive actions? And so our challenge to you is, how can you develop a solution leveraging existing data to help citizens be better informed to make nature conscious decisions? Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so these are just sort of some of the areas you could look at. So as an individual, we do still have power um, and our actions do count and uniting our actions can make a big impact. Um, so some of the areas you could look at would be our convenience culture and how we can address that, whether it's, um, uh, you know, takeaway cups, uh, fast fashion, um, or sort of lazy time-saving moves, whether it's overconsumption with buying too much or packaging, um, whether it's about waste and not only how much we're wasting, but also whether we're actually separating that waste so that it can actually be recycled and used properly again, um, how we're polluting or littering um, our environment, 
be that through um, traffic fumes or whether it's actually littering on the ground. Um, and then how we can look at um, fixing our disconnection from nature, uh, from being able to really reconnect with where our food comes from, how our farming happens and really fix that connection there. So those are some of the challenges which you could look to address. Next challenge, please. Um, and we really want to, to sort of help create sustained behavior change in citizens. And for that, it's really important to follow the three key principles of behavior change. So it's providing our target audience with the right knowledge that we want them to know, uh, making sure that information is reliable, understandable, um, and makes them want to sit up and take action. We want them to be able to emotionally connect with the problem and the solution so that they are invested and wanting to, and emotionally connected to wanting to make that change and do your solution. And we want to make sure that we're providing them with access to it. So how can we make them um, easily, effectively make that change so that it is sustainable and part of everyday life? Next slide, please. So yeah, so we're very much focused on the citizen and we have partnered with uh, Bristol and the Knoll West Neighbourhoods Living, Living Lab, um, which we're really excited about. And I will introduce Melissa now um, from We Can Make, who's going to talk a bit more about Bristol. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Francesca. Brilliant to be here. So yes, I'm Melissa. I'm director of We Can Make and part of the consortium of neighbourhood-based organisations in Knoll West that have come together to work together on this. Um, so Knoll West is a hundred-year-old council-built estate of 15,000 uh, people. Uh, and the builders who originally built out our estate 100 years ago, their nickname for Knoll West was the 5,000 Island Forest because we're 5,000 homes sitting on a hill surrounded by greenery. Um, so we're influenced by uh, garden city principles, so think of lots of wide streets, uh, big gar gardens and privet hedges. And on those kind of uh, on those slopes surrounding us is quite wild kind of green space uh, where we've got kind of horses, um, kind of uh, uh, common uh, um, grass grazing and all sorts of things. And we've got a nice network of community based allotments as well. Um, so, so lots of really great, brilliant, uh, close by nature kind of assets to explore, but also facing some challenges as well. So we've only got 13% tree coverage, a third of our front gardens have been lost to car parks, and access to those green spaces is really poor. So we've got some great nature assets, we've also got some brilliant people assets to bring into this challenge. Um, so you kind of scratch the surface of our, of our estate and you find out there's all sorts of skills and know-how here. Um, we uh, created something called the University of Local Knowledge, which um, is a collection database of, of this kind of knowledge, where it's got over a thousand videos of community know-how. And on that, you'll find everything from people inventing their own cloud computing systems to kind of instructions of how to catch and skin a rabbit. So we think we've got a really nice mix of things that we can bring into this. Um, and we're really excited about this kind of design-led program because as kind of three organizations working together, we can make Mel West Media Center and we are more. What brings us together is a love of art, tech and people and mixing those things together to see how we can live better together. So Mel West has been um, is part of the European network of living labs. Um, and this is part of recognizing that we um, are a mature neighborhood test space for trying to try out some new ideas. Um, so we've got a maker space, um, which is kitted out with digital and design kit, kind of laser uh, uh, printers and uh, laser cutters and CNC machines and uh, 3D printers and other things. So what's really great, it means we can prototype tangibly and ratably those kind of new ideas. Um, uh, we're already kind of actively really working with nature-based solutions as well. So using, for example, um, uh, biomaterials and digital fabrication kit to make components for homes and retrofit of existing homes. Um, and we really like, like mixing things up. So for example, uh, we worked at kind of air quality data uh, and the impact of wood burners. And we turned this into a drum and bass songification dashboard to really kind of connect, it, connect with people. Also, as part of our team, we've got Bristol City Council and the Natural History Consortium. So we've got access to really fantastic um, data. And I think overall, what we can do is like really bring this kind of um, kit and community know-how and match that with SME creativity and really get kind of collaborating together. Um, we're really excited for this particular challenge area. 
um, because we think we nature-based solutions can play a key role in how we adapt our, our home streets and green spaces to meet kind of new emerging challenges. And I think two particular kind of opportunities and how we're thinking about this, very much interesting, not as kind of how nature-based solutions can work as kind of individual consumer choices, but how can we kind of use this to make kind of bring people together and make collective action? So, for example, we know for how we've been working on our biomaterial um, street demonstrator uh, retrofit project, where we're working with 20 plus families, we know and have shown how why working together, people's appetite for more behavior change, more nature based solutions is much higher if people are working together rather than collectively, uh, rather than individually. Um, and then the other opportunity here, we are really, really here to develop ideas for real. Um, we're developing a neighbourhood climate investment plan, which is backed by Innovate UK and our Metro Authority and others. So we're actively trying to find that portfolio of investable community rooted ideas and solutions that can really scale. So, yeah, this is definitely, you know, excited for this. It's not just a kind of one off kind of project or design exercise, but to really generate some future facing solutions that we can apply and scale at the neighbourhood level. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. I'll go next and uh, introduce the challenge three. Um, my name is Giulia Bencini. I'm the senior service designer for the satellite applications catapult, and I'm leading from uh, the challenge three perspective. Um, after me, uh, Louise White is also going to introduce our third uh, incredible location partner, Sussex Way, uh, and he is the scientific lead for um, this organization. So if we go to the next slide. Um, I'm talking on behalf of the Satellite Applications Catapult, and um, we are at the earth of the satellite services revolution. We really aim to drive the take up of space technology and applications to shape and sustain the world of tomorrow. If we go to the next slide, we support both large and small organizations, and we help them bring in new services to market. And a really big part of our job is also connecting industry and academia to get new research off the ground and into the market more quickly. Ultimately, we really want to innovate for a better world that is empowered by space. Going to the next slide, one of our core missions is about creating the greatest positive difference to global society, which I think, uh, sorry, the, the previous one, the previous uh, slide. Yes, perfect, thank you. Uh, which I think really shows how committed we are to creating a more sustainable future. We know that space has an incredible potential for uh, sustainability, and we know as well that the UK economy is really well placed to lead the adoption of space for sustainability. However, there are several barriers to the adoption of space data, services and technologies that could potentially really help and support uh, our planet. Let's cover uh, three key barriers that are also closely connected to our design to deliver challenge and hopefully will motivate you and inspire uh, your applications as well. So if we go to the next slide, first of all, technical uh, space related data and space enabled data is not translated into understandable and actionable information. And there's a gap that is also physical um, but also from a kind of knowledge perspective between where the data gets collected and people on earth uh, who need to use these data. Um, most of the times possible users of these data don't really understand it and therefore don't really see its potential as well, which is a big, uh, is a big challenge um, in the market. We therefore need not only understandable jargon-free uh, and application-specific uh, information, but we also need user-friendly tools to be able to access, explore, and process data um, in a way that allows people to really uh, take action um, on, on those. If we go to the next slide, a second important barrier is that users don't always trust space-enabled data, which most of the times feels really abstract and conceptual as well. Um, and the lack of visibility, uh, where data comes from, how it's procured and how it's processed, means that users find it really hard to trust. So to address this, this issue and this problem, we need to create more transparent processes for collecting processes, processing, but also distributing these data. And going to the next uh, barrier, um, different sources of, so the next slide um, as well, 
different sources of space-enabled data are not effectively used together, missing a really big opportunity to leverage the full potential of these, uh, of these data. Specifically, combining different data sources coming from, for example, remote sensing and earth observation drones, ground-based sensors, uh, just to mention a few, can really generate a rich and reliable stream of data that can inform decisive action for climate mitigation and sustainable growth as well. These issues uh, frame um, and bring us to our challenge, which is in the next slide, if we can go to that one. And the third challenge is therefore space-enabled information for a thriving world. How can you translate space-enabled data and services into information that is trusted and actionable, fueling responsible behaviors towards nature? As we know, the scale and quality of space-enabled data and services has risen exponentially in the past decade. Um, we all know that new satellites are, are launched, new services are available, more advanced technologies are getting developed as well. But as mentioned, the resulting volume of really complex data sets can be difficult to comprehend and action. And um, it's really hard for users to trust this data or even combine these data with uh, other technologies that they might already be using and might be useful for them. So how can we change this? Um, this is our challenge for you, and, and hopefully uh, this will inspire and drive your applications uh, to the program. Um, going to the next slide, just to give you some example of scenarios you could work with, uh, you could think about biodiversity recovery. So for example, you could um, decide to combine earth observation data and sensors on the ground to measure habitat condition and monitor biodiversity. Or maybe you want to work with uh, farmers, uh, land management, and agriculture, and you decide to bring space-enabled data and services into effective decision-making tools that can help those users care for the long-term health of soil, water quality, and flood mitigation. Or maybe, on the other hand, you want to work with communities and businesses, and you really want to engage with them to gather data on the ground that complements monitoring nature from space to better inform local decision making and regulatory uh, compliance. Uh, keep in mind that these are just some examples to inspire you. So please, um, uh, we encourage you to be as bold and as open as you want and dream big when, when thinking about your, your application. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, I'm going to conclude um, introducing our third amazing location partner, Sussex Bay. And um, if we go to the next slide, I'll hand it over to Lewis White, who is the scientific lead for Sussex Bay, who will um, talk a bit more about what they do and their motivation to join the program. So over to you, Louise. Thank you. Thank you and good morning everyone. I am Lewis White, the scientific lead for Sussex Bay. Sussex Bay is on a mission to regenerate nature across our hundred miles of coastline for the benefit of those ecosystems, but also the local communities that live there and for local economy and business. We truly believe that when nature is thriving, so do, so do the benefits be felt for people and economy. Being a hundred miles of coastline, um, we are diverse in the type of habitats that we share here from shingles and rivers to uh, marine off uh, marine environments, including our kelp beds, which are currently um, being monitored because of their recent protections, as well as other protected sites. Those hundred miles of coastline have a different pressures and different needs. Coastal communities are um, some of the poorest in our countries and the least disparate, uh, the most disparate, apologies. And the pressures that we face come from our need for monitoring the marine environment, which is often quite expensive compared to terrestrial monitoring, as well as diversity in where they're coming from, from riverine pollution to coastal erosion and all of the added problems that come with it. We are taking a source to sea approach in Sussex Bay, looking all the way up rivers and out to sea to understand what is needing to change to benefit Sussex Bay. And we're taking a full seascape approach. We're looking at natural capital approaches, which means that we understand the benefits that we get from nature, who is benefiting and where that change can come from as we make decisions. As I said, uh, marine and coastal monitoring is often very expensive. They're, they're harder to get to than um, some of the terrestrial habitats. And so the satellite and earth observation catapult was particularly exciting for us because we see the benefit that this could have in answering some problems that we have in monitoring but also understanding how that that data can be used to answer questions for 
the communities and groups that we work with all the way down to individuals and understanding what is going on in our environment, what we have, where we have it and the condition that it might be in. Thank you. Thank you very much to our challenge leads and our location partners. Um, I hope you've enjoyed their presentations and um, started to understand what the brief looks like in a bit more sort of concrete manners. I am now going to hand over to my colleague, Anya. Um, there she is. Hi, Anya. And I'm going to hand over to her to take you through the competitions. Hello, everyone. I'm Anya Moriarty. I'm the Innovation Funding Programme Manager at Connected Places Catapult. I work very closely with Julia Lorenzini and Becca Moore on the delivery of this programme. So this morning, I'm going to run through an overview of the Innovation Funding Programme and how to submit a strong application. I also wanted to note, I know that we've gone through a lot of information this morning already, but we do have time allocated at the end for any questions, and we will share a document answering all of your questions and access to this recording by next week. Myself, Julia and Becca will also be here throughout to support you with the application process. Next slide, please, Kat. So a design to deliver innovation funding overview. So this program is focused on design, collaboration and collective impact. The aim is to bring together different skill sets and address key challenges and work towards practical solutions. The design to, de design to deliver is built around a central brief from which each of the three catapults, sorry, <clears throat> has developed a specific challenge statement based on their expertise. This approach ensures that we'll address the problem from multiple angles. Each catapult will support up to four SMEs which means up to 12 projects will be funded in total across the three challenge areas. Each SME-led project will receive up to £50,000 to develop a testing plan during the programme. This plan will run from January to March 2025, and the funding will help you test and advance your proposed solution. Next slide, please, Kat. The opportunities within this programme. One of the most integral parts of Design to Deliver is the opportunity to team up with a dedicated location partner to test and develop your solution in a real, real world setting. You'll also have access to a design consultancy that will help you embed design into your processes and make it a key part of your strategy. You can secure up to £50,000 to help develop your solution and create a plan for a three month trial. You will benefit from the industry specific expertise and technical support of the Catapult team to move your project forward. You will also get support for your trial. So you will get help designing your trial to make sure that it's set up for success. Next slide, please, Kat. So the key dates for design to deliver. We are open from now until the 25th of October. Prior to the closing date, we also have access to drop-in sessions with each of the relevant catapults. This will be a chance for you to meet with a specific, specific catapult that is aligned with your challenge and either myself, Julia or Becca will be there to answer any questions. The, there is access to book in with these drop-in ses sessions on our website but we also have guidance on how to do this later in the webinar. We'd encourage all SMEs to attend. It's an opportunity for you to raise any questions and all of the time is allocated to answering what you bring to us. After the application deadline on the 25th of October, we will begin our internal review, which will commence from the end of, from the end of October to the end of November. In December, we will commence our interviews and select our cohort. And from January 2025 to the end of March 2025, we will run the Design to Deliver program. Next slide, please, Kat. Oh, I sorry, the previous slide I had, I had another note. So a very important thing for us to outline is how you're going to work within this program. 
So from early January, you'll be working with your design consultant and location partner. Together, you're going to identify the milestones that you will work towards. You will work towards these milestones in a sprint format, and the catapult will be with you throughout with support and expertise. Throughout the program, there will be a kickoff event, a mid-program and an end of program cohort touch point. Next slide, please, Kat. Eligibility. All of our eligibility criteria is outlined in our application guidance document, which is accessible via the website. Just to run through it again this morning, the lead organization must be a UK registered company. The technology submitted have to be of TRL level five or above. This is detailed more in the application guidance document. You must show demonstrable alignment to your chosen challenge. You must be able to test or trial in locations across the UK. As a lead organization, you must have the capacity to deliver in the assigned period, which is January to March 2025. There may be some travel to meetings and events required, but we will liaise with you if any reasonable adjustments are needed. Next slide, please, Kat. The application process. So it is important to choose your challenge and note the relevant location partner. You can check our eligibility criteria again in the guidance document. We'd really encourage you to read the guidance application guide, the application guidance document in full. It outlines everything that you need to submit a strong application. The application process itself covers general questions, due diligence questions, project questions, and optional EDI questions. The project areas are where we apply your weighted scoring. I'm going to discuss this more in detail on the next slide. You must ensure that your application is submitted by the deadline of the 25th of October at 5 p.m. And something to note is that our software will automatically save your responses. So you do have an opportunity to go in and comment some questions and come back and refine if you want to get more information or give it a second set of eyes before you click submit. Again, just echoing that myself, Becca and Julia are available throughout. Our email address is detailed here and it's also visible on our website and guidance document. The next slide, please, Kat. Our scoring. So our scoring criteria is where we weight the scoring that allows us to evaluate all of the applications with the same format. Throughout your application, we will ask specific questions to learn about key areas of, of your solution. The way that we have here is allocated to emphasize the value of specific areas of your solution. What we have here detailed is the program fit. This is how you demonstrate your alignment with the design to deliver program. This is a weight of 30%. The next criteria is the solution. So how your solution will address the specific challenge that you've chosen. This is a weighted rate scoring of 25%. Project management, this is how you will manage your trial design. This is a weighted scoring of 15%. The impact is the impact of your proposal. We ask you questions throughout this to probe thinking and specifics on these areas. The impact has a weighted scoring of 20%. The team will also have to be detailed. If that's who you will be working with and the skill set of who you will be working with. And this is a weighted scoring of 10%. This is detailed in full with a more granular breakdown in the application guidance document. And we can go through specific questions on this in the catapult drop-in sessions. The next slide, please, Kat. This is the information regarding the Catapult drop-in sessions where you can get that specific one-to-one -one support. They are being run on the 10th of October from the Digital Catapult at 10 o'clock, also on the 10th of October with satellite applications at 2 o'clock, and on the 11th of October with Connected Places Catapult at 10 o'clock. If you have any queries, we have the email detailed here, and it's also on our site or in our application guidance documents. Next slide, please, Kat. That's everything from me, and I believe now we're opening up for a QA. and a 
We are indeed. Thank you, Anya. So I would kindly ask all my colleagues who have spoken so far to turn their cameras on. And I would also invite um, a few other um, Catapult colleagues who you have not seen so far, but will shortly appear on screen. Before we start with the Q&A, and thank you everyone for the questions um, so far, please continue to um, uh, add them to the Q&A function. I'm going to do a quick uh, round of introductions. So, um, briefly, I'm going to go by Catapult, if that's okay first. So, you've met Anya, myself. Um, Pete, do you want to quickly reintroduce yourself and Ellie? Yeah, I'm Pete Broadbent. So I'm the design lead here at Connected Places Catapult. Um, yeah, I've been working on this uh, since the very beginning. So, yeah. Yeah, and Ellie, you've heard from her. There she I'm is. Ellie Pearl. I'm a senior service designer at the Connected Places Catapult. Perfect. I'm now moved to uh, our digital Catapult colleagues, Francesca and Elmer, please. Yeah, hi again. So I'm Francesca. I'm the senior product designer at Digital Catapult. And I'm Elmer Zinkon. I'm the head of design at Digital Catapult. And like Pete, uh, involved from the very start of the program to help shape this. Uh, looking forward to see your applications. And we now have the satellites, um, Catapult, Julia and Catherine. Um, hi again, everyone. Julia Bencini, Satellite Application Catapult, senior service designer, as well as um, Ellie and Jessica. Catherine, over to you. Hi, everybody. I'm um, Catherine Green. I'm head of the user centered design team at the Satellite Applications Catapult. I, of course, forgot to introduce my own colleague, Becca. I'm really sorry, Becca. I knew that something was going to happen today. Uh, so apologies. She is going to be very important because she's going to be the one who's going to check um, and actually release the funding to all the successful applicants. So Becca, would you like to introduce yourself briefly? Yeah, so I'm Becca. I'm Innovation Funding Officer at CPC. And yes, very important because if you don't go through me, you don't get your money. So very important. <laughs> Yeah, sorry about that, Becca. Um, and last but not least, we've got our three um, reps from the three location partners. So can we briefly um, reintroduce uh, Melissa? I'm going to start with you since you're on top of my screen. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Melissa and I'm from the Bristol Place Partner. So working with DigiCat. Yeah. There we go. Digi and then I'm going to go over to Lewis. Hello again, Lewis White from Sussex Bay and working with the Satellite Applications Catapult. And uh, you now have uh, Katrina. Unfortunately, Francesca had to um, leave us. We did know about that. So Katrina is now ready uh, to fill in Francesca's shoes. Yep. Hi, everyone. Katrina Kilkenny, the Innovation Manager at Shift at London Legacy Development Corporation. Brilliant. Perfect. So now you've got all of us now on screen. Uh, you can um, grill us as much as you want. I'm going to have a look at the q and I've had a few um, already selected to start answering live. So let's start from uh, Demetrius. Thank you for your question. The question is, how are we going to connect SMEs and designer? So I'm going to hand over to Ellie, Julia and Francesca, um, if you can briefly can articulate that. Sure. So um, we uh, have been interviewing location partners and you see our selection here. We've also been doing the same with design consultancies. So each uh, of us of Catapult has selected two design consultancies um, who will work on each of our challenges. So we will be looking for four SMEs and we'll be providing two SMEs per uh, design consultancy so we we're, we're providing that support for you you don't have to worry about that um, and then we'll match you up uh, at the selection process brilliant thank you Francesca anything else to add Ellie and Julia no I don't think so perfect um, I'm going to move to the next questions which two uh, different attendees have asked around um, the number of applications can that can be submitted so I'm going to start off um, and then I'm going to hand over to anyone who would like to add to it. So you are more than welcome to submit more than one application. We're not going to stop you clearly from doing that. Different application will have to be submitted as separate um, ideas. So um, 
through the platform, you will have to submit different application forms, if that makes sense. So two application forms, if you have two ideas that you want to put forward. Um, that is if you believe that your technology um, is relevant and is applicable to multiple challenges. That said, um, we would definitely encourage you to look through the application guidance documents and um, ensure that you understand the requirements, both time-wise and resource uh, commitments for the projects. However, we will only choose one SME. So we will only choose one idea per SME. So you will only be able to be awarded one um, pot of funding, if that makes sense. Um, Anyone else would like to add to that? I hope that was clear enough. If it wasn't, please add another questions on the Q&A and I will. Francesca, did you want to come in? Yeah, I just wanted to double check that um, each of us will be, each catapult will be uh, reviewing our own application. So if you're doing, if you're applying for two, you do need to do the entire application process again. Otherwise, we won't see them. Thank you. Okay, um, we are going to move to location partners now. Louis, there's a couple of questions for Sussex Bay. Um, I'm not sure if you've seen them. Uh, if not, I can read them out for you. There's one from Daniel. Yeah, I've, I've seen them. I'll try and group my answers into to keep things brief for everyone. Yeah. So Sussex Bay is, in essence, looking at the coastal and marine environment, but our boundaries are, are considered blurred. We're looking right inland, up rivers, and we're working with communities all across Sussex. We're interested in understanding the benefits that we receive from the coast and marine all the way inland, connecting people that don't usually visit the coast, for example. We're working with groups and businesses all across Sussex, including um, farmers, uh, to understand the impacts that farmers are having on uh, freshwater environments, which may eventually end up in the marine environment. Uh, we have loads of potential case study areas within Sussex for small projects and the plan for us is to build that blueprint of all of the work that's going on and look at Sussex in that collective and therefore for this particular programme we'd be really interested in people um, coming up with ideas that may narrow that down and say that they could test something in a particular area. Um, but yeah, to really emphasise that, that our boundary is is outside of the bay itself and we're looking at how we can incorporate all of the evidence that's being collected right around Sussex to understand the pressures facing our marine and coastal environment, but also how that we can benefit from them more broadly. Let me know if I've not answered anything there, Julia. I think you've covered them all. Um, thank you, Louis. I'm going to stay on the Sussex Bay satellite apps um, challenge. So, Julia, we've got a question from um, Bethan Adams. Is it possible to work beyond the location partner? We would be looking to focus our application on satellite enabled freshwater data. So there may be additional pilot sites beyond Sussex Bay. Yeah, so I think we're not super strict in terms of uh, you need to be working only like in everything that you do, you need to be within the area. You can grab data from other areas. You can, for example, if you need to build a uh, algorithm a machine learning system you might need a lot of data so we might appreciate it you don't find all of these data in the area that we want to work with our location partner but then once you have the tool then we want you to bring it back to the area and find a way to test it into the area and make it relevant for the communities i really think that the power of the location partners and like the opportunity for you is having a place where you can connect with real people with real spaces and and that's an opportunity for you to test your thing and then that can be potentially scaled up and so on but yeah so you're able to extend but then you need to bring it back and connect to the area and test it there and, and make that connection if that makes sense Excellent. and Lewis, if uh, you yeah want to add anything to that please do thank you julia um so Ellie, I'm going to come to you for a slightly broader question um, around um, consult design consultancies. The question is, what would the design consultancies actually be expected to deliver in the project? So can you maybe articulate what the role is? Yeah. Um, so I guess the main point of the program is to bring, bring designers and innovators together. So we are expecting the designers to um, bring their design expertise and methodologies um, and help go through a series of uh, rapid sprints with the uh, SMEs that they are working with and help them um, develop their service or product. Um, 
Currently at the moment, um, it is quite open because um, what we're expecting the design consultancies to do is to tailor the, um, the uh, methodologies that they're working through and the expertise that they're giving um, to each of the SMEs that they're working with. Um, so at the start of the programme, we'll be doing um, planning with the SMEs and the design consultancies to um, establish a really clear plan of what you will be working with with the design consultancies so that then over the course of January to March, um, yeah, th that will be what you'll be working through with the design consultancies. Uh, Elma, did you want to come in? Oh, I think you're still on mute. Ah, oh, classic. Um, <laughs> so I, I did want to kind of uh, also clarify a little bit because design can mean many things to many companies. And uh, the way that we looked at design and the way that we look at the design consultancy support us is very much from typically kind of the UX to serve design space. So that is kind of help you go through the program, help you get access to users, help you kind of figure out kind of what people might say. Uh, all those things that will help you really validate your proposal or your, your concept or your, your prototype. We can, we, the design consultants are there to kind of help you make sure you get the right insights and help you kind of build your proposition really. That, that's what we expect most of them to be able to kind of do. And that can be quite early stage, a um, bit more strategic, but also maybe a bit more practical in terms of like delivering uh, maybe a prototype or a tool and do UX uh, activities like that, for example. Uh, but we have a good range of different design consultancies across the across the board. Yeah, I guess that's what I would add is the, the design consultancies that we're working with offer a broad range of um, expertise. And that's the process that we'll be going through um, in the selection is doing that matchmaking to make sure that the design consultancies can work with the SMEs that are chosen. Thank you both. Um, I'm going to leave you to raise your hand to whoever wants to answer the next one. Um, Nora from University of Sussex is asking, in relation to the informed choice challenge, reference was made to using existing data. Is there an openness to generating new data to inform choice? Yes, there is. Um, you don't have to use existing data. Um, I think the idea was that if you if you don't want to be creating your own data, um, then how can we leverage the copious amounts of data that's already out there and to make that uh, relatable and understandable? If, however, you have been um, collecting your own data and that feeds into your solution, that's absolutely fine as well. Thank you, Francesca. Anyone else want to add anything? Okay, um, in, in which case we're going to move to a delivery question. So perhaps Anya, I might come to you, but equally, um, Elia, Francesca and Julia, please um, step in. So the question is, um, can we clarify the timeline and the delivery period? So from January to March, does the work include test planning, design work, tech development, plus local community trials? So during January to March, just for, again, clarity, um, you will be working with your location partners, with the design consultancy, uh, developing a trial design. Francesca? Yeah. yeah, so so what we have sort of roughly sketched out at the moment is uh, for the design consultancies to help you through probably three sprints from January to March um, uh, within your location. Uh, when... The selected teams will meet um, and then that, as Ellie was saying, that will be sort of fleshed out to, to be appropriate for you and for your uh, design uh, levels. Um, but the idea is for you to sort of maybe take your initial solution and test that in the local communities and with local residents, then to maybe uh, test the viability of it, uh, desirability of it. Um, or feasibility with each sprint probably developing it a bit more um, and as said we we're hoping that you're at least at, at TRL level five and then that we've so you've got something which probably has been tested before and you're bringing it to a new location to see how it can apply elsewhere and will help you to develop that. Thank you. I hope that answers, um, I think it was Kate's um, question. So just for clarity, from January to March, you will be developing a trial design. You'll not be doing the actual live trial within those uh, two and a half months that might follow, but more on that later. Um, so there was a question. So if we move on to the more financial um, end of things, Becca, 
um, you might want to take a couple of this one. So I clearly lost it. There we go. Uh, someone is asking, um, in terms of finance, uh, are we paying in advance or arrears? Can you maybe just mention, either you or Anya, um, the split of the funding? I think I just want to confirm, um, I'm not actually 100% sure on the split of funding, how we're splitting up initially, but from what I assume, it's going to be initial payment at the start and then towards the end of the programme, or if it's a three-way split, um, you'll be, evidence isn't um, necessary for this because it's pre-commercial, but you will have to fill out documentation of what you've spent, if there's any differences to what you said you'd spend at the start, just so that if you know, if you said you're going to spend 10K on one material, and then we guess to the end, you've actually spent 20K, just so that we can figure out what's gone on there. But um, I'm not 100% sure on the split. I think that'd be either for yeah. you, on you or Julia. Anya, do you want to take this? So it's 50% at the start of the program and it's 50% at the end of the program. That's the that's the split. Thank you both. Um, we're going to move back to... Um, so there's a couple of questions on technology readiness level. Um, Tierra level five, if it's not a technology, but rather a platform, addressing overconsumption, how would you assess its readiness? Perhaps Pete or Elmer or Catherine, if you want to take this one. Um, I'll, be, I'll be able to take this and then Pete, uh, Catherine, maybe you want to kind of like make your own kind of adjustments uh, if, if that makes it clearer. Um, so TRL, um, I'm not quite sure if every uh, company on the call at the moment know, knows about them in detail, but they obviously come from a really technical kind of background. What it really is about, though, is some level of maturity in how you've developed your idea. So uh, TRL levels one to three are very much about you, you have an idea and it might actually much, be much more like a sketch. Uh, so when we say TRL level five, what we kind of want to get to is that you you actually have a prototype or have a thing that you can bring in in some way. Ideally, it's a slightly slightly further formed uh, concept than, than just an idea. Um, and in terms of technology, uh, also answering another question that's related to that. Um, from my perspective, and also what's what's important for Digital Catapult, it, it does have some technical uh, 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 link to it, but it doesn't have to be a pure technology to develop. So it could be a tech-enabled solution or something that allows you to kind of make something better or stronger by the use of technology, because that that is particularly our aim. Uh, but TRL5, to, to me and hopefully to you, um, is not necessarily purely a technical solution on its own, um, but it is something that's slightly more mature than just an idea. Um, that's that's my, my first kind of response to that. Anyone uh, Pete? Want to add? Pete? Um, nothing to add. I don't think I'd know. completely agree with that. Likewise, well answered, Elmer. Um, um, I'm going to take. I'm going to group a couple of um, of questions together just uh, to provide clarity. I see um, someone is still confused about the time scales. So, from January to March, for these periods, um, the applicants, the successful applicants, will receive fifty thousand pounds to develop a trial design. That trial design piece with various deliverables to be agreed uh, upon commencement. Um, those deliverables will be expected uh, towards mid-March, roughly speaking, end of March. Um, during that period, um, what you'll be working with, with the location partners and the um, design consultants and the selected catapult uh, design team is a trial design piece. So you will be um, analyzing and um, understanding what a full-on trial could look like. So you'll be designing all the aspects of that. You will not be expected to deliver the trial in situ, so to speak. I hope that provides some reassurance and clarity. Anyone else would like to add to that? Okay. Um, I'm going to scroll up to the questions. Apologies, there's a few more that have come in. Um, from a funding perspective, so uh, Demetrius, you were asking whether a design consultancy should be costed into 
um, as a subcontractor, no. So um, in your £50,000, you should not be including a location partner or design consultancy cost. Um, the two um, the, the two partners, so the location partners and the design consultancies um, are being uh, paid and costed separately. Uh, so you do not have, applicants do not have to cost them in in the £50,000. Um, uh, challenge two. So Francesca Elmer, back to you. We've got a question from Peter. Does the application uh, need to be for UK wide application, I guess, or just Bristol? Your thoughts on that? Yeah, so as a solution, we obviously want it to, to scale and grow. So ideally, it will become UK wide. But what we're wanting to do is test it in one location now to see if it works. So being at TOL level five, hopefully you have a prototype that maybe you've tested somewhere else already. And so this is an opportunity to test it with different communities um, in a different location. And that by the end of March, it should be uh, improve the scale and a TOL level should have increased so that we can then, you know, you could be able to test it further afield uh, and make it scale. But we will only be testing in Bristol uh, for this. However, yeah, the solution shouldn't be only uh, applicable to Bristol. Thank you. If I can add, add to that, because yeah, I think our answer is actually not, not, not dissimilar to, to what uh, Julia uh, said before about Sussex as well. So it's just like, we want to make sure that we can bring together the solutions that are in and tested within Bristol. So we can kind of present it in a place as well, where that's kind of the, the, the big point. Um, yes, it's absolutely valid and valuable to have uh, solutions that are uh, applicable UK-wide. Thank you. Um, Julia Bintini, I'm going to come back to you. Um, a question from Annabelle. Julia, and actually it's for you and Lewis. Are you looking for physical products or innovation or would digital products also be suitable? For example, a smartphone app that leverages GPS technology to measure and monitor the environment at scale on the ground rather than satellite data per se. Yeah, so I think we're really open in that sense and we encourage you to be as open as you want to be as well. We definitely want the connection with um, space, but we're calling them space enabled data because we don't want only earth observation data to, to for you to work with, but we would really encourage you to work with uh, connectivity as well, um, PNT, yeah, GP, GPS technology, anything that is kind of powered and enabled by space. Um, so yeah, uh, in that sense, you're more than welcome and is everything is open to you like for, for any proposals in that sense. And yeah, as well, uh, digital versus physical, there's no there's no preference you have uh, the you can make the call and decide what you want to present thank you Luis. anything to add brilliant um i'm conscious of time we've got one minute so i'm going to take two more questions and then um if there are any others we'll um endeavor to either go back to you um directly or add them to the frequently asked questions um document which will also uh, be published on monday next week uh, the question is, is there a way to find more successful precedent pro projects um, that follow the same model, either as part of this project or from sim similar developments? Are there examples of really outstanding uh, project outcomes that could be used as inspiration? So I'll start off and then maybe um, someone raise their hands. Uh, this is the first um, design to deliver uh, program of these kind. So there is no precedent to this one per se, but I'm going to leave the design experts to maybe give a few hints or tips about other previous examples. I'm waiting for someone to raise their hands or unmute themselves. Thank you, oh, Elmer. There we oh, go. I was, I was trying to nudge like Peace and Catherine as well, because you've been involved from the start. Um, the, the reason why this is so exciting, because yeah, like, like Julia is saying, that there is, there is no direct representation. So uh, to me, it would be what are successful uh, implementations or technologies or solutions that you've seen actually resonate with communities that actually have made a change in how people have that uh, relationship with nature, how uh, it changed the way that maybe it's affected policy around it, uh, how it changed communities and how they build, how they think about things. 
Uh, I don't have an example, I'm afraid, because like like it was said by Julia, this is a first of its kind type of project. Um, you are our pilot. Um, and with that, I think it's super exciting to see how far you can push it. That that'll be my angle, but I think Kat might have something slightly different to say. Okay. I mean, I agree. It's, 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 we work with um, SMEs all the time. Our team is really involved in a huge range of projects, but actually um, mapping or understanding that impact is what we've always struggled with. And that is the point of this program. Um, but um, yes, I mean, I'm not going to choose pull one out because I don't want, it's unfair to pull, but a, a recent example was where there was a company with um, a product, a prototype, but actually accessibility, it wasn't that useful, but usability, usable, it was hard to access and just working on that user interface over a period of a few months, our team was able to um, make it more impactful and really support them in commercializing that product. So that's one example. Yeah, and I think we have we have experience of, of, of elements of this. And so across the catapults and across our location partners, we know what a good, trial plan looks like so we know you know we've done a lot of trialing we've chosen location partners who also have uh, a, a strong connection with doing trialing because that is part of it we've done lots of projects where we've done work with communities to, to really get to understand the challenges that they have and the problems that they have um putting all three together is unique to we haven't done that with this design to deliver is the first time we've taken smes working with location partners and working with uh, design consultancies, but we've done constituent parts of it separately. Um, and we've put this together because we believe that if we work with a location partner to really understand their challenges so that you can make your solutions more applicable to them, but as we described, still scalable, um, we will get better outcomes. Um, so yeah, we can. We when if the successful candidates will be working very closely with you around around those component parts, uh, specifically around what a good trial plan looks like. Brilliant, thank you, Pete. Um, on that note, um, I'm just going to answer very briefly two questions, and then we're going to close the webinar for today. Um, will we provide feedback on applications? We will endeavour to provide as much feedback as we can. Um, once uh, once we know who the successful applicants are. So uh, the answer is yes, we will try to do that as much as possible. Um, and the second question that I'll briefly mention, um, someone asked, uh, what do we need to cover in the £50,000? So um, again, I will redirect you to the application guidance document. Please read through the document. It will pretty much tell you um, what do you need to do and how to, to build your application. Um, within those £50,000, we expect you to cost in your time, your team's time, any material that you may or may not need, any data that you may or may not think that is required, and anything else that um, you think you would uh, you would require to to deliver um, the, the, the trial design. Um, if you, if the people that have asked those questions would like any further clarifications, please do get in touch. Um, our email address is on the documentations and maybe we can also drop it in the chat now. Uh, it's design number two, deliver at cp.catapult.org.uk. On that note, I wish everyone a lovely day. Uh, it's quite rainy here, but there we go. Um, have a lovely day and we look forward to receiving your applications. And thank you very much to all my colleagues for joining us today.